Snow White is one of the quintessential German fairy tales, written in 1812 by the Brothers Grimm. The story is well known the world over, largely thanks to the 1937 animated feature film Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs from Disney. Both the story and film shared an enthusiastic fan in Adolf Hitler, the infamous German dictator from 1933 to 1945. Hitler was also a big fan of Walt Disney. Something virtually unknown today is that in 1938, Disney produced a German-language dub of Snow White on Hitler's wishes. Though this version wasn't released during the Third Reich, it would be released in Germany following the end of World War II. The cast was made up of uncredited German speakers living in Amsterdam. These weren't just any actors, however. These were some of the finest actors in German cinematic history. They were also Jews living in exile, most of whom would be murdered in the Holocaust. Today we're going to take a look at the production of the German language version of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, produced for the Third Reich and featuring Jewish actors who would be killed before the film would even see a release. We'll also try to answer the age-old question of Walt Disney's alleged anti-Semitism and if he had mutual respect for Hitler. Was Disney an anti-Semite? Let's find out. Before we begin, we should discuss anti-Semitism, so everyone is on the same page. Anti-Semitism is commonly defined as hatred or bigotry against Jewish people, but it's a little more complicated than that. The term anti-Semitism was coined as a negative meant to paint European Jews as Semitic, which is an antiquated term for Middle Eastern people. Semites were people who spoke Semitic languages like Hebrew, Arabic, and Aramaic. Most European Jews looked and dressed like other Europeans, but many held on to old world traditions and customs, so anti-Semites would attempt to frame the Jew as an untrustworthy other from the East. Jews were a common target in Europe as they were an extreme minority with their own customs and language, Yiddish, as well as segregation laws that dictated who could conduct what type of business. In the Middle Ages, Christians weren't allowed to loan money and collect interest, but Jews could, so many Jewish people took jobs as bankers and tax collectors. This created a deliberate buffer between the wealthy royal elite and the common masses, as Jewish people were the ones collecting taxes for the wealthy, and thus the common people would aim their frustration at those who physically took their money away. This legal division that economically coerced Jews into jobs concerning money has led to the stereotype of the greedy Jew that persists to this day. This is why it was easy for someone to stand up, declare the Jews to be Germany's enemy, and have everyone unite against them. Now back to Walt Disney. He grew up in Kansas City, Missouri as an all-American boy with a paper route. After serving in World War I, Disney started an animation studio in Kansas City before moving to Hollywood. By the mid-1920s, he was making a name for himself as one of the top names in animation, and in 1928 he would release Steamboat Willie, the first major sound cartoon starring Mickey Mouse. The success of Steamboat Willie made Disney a household name the world over, including Germany. Disney used his newfound success to expand his animation studio, and would eventually begin production on the first full-color animated feature film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. After the National Socialists came to power in Germany in 1933, Hollywood was still exporting movies to Germany on a regular basis. Many studios like Paramount, Fox, Warner Brothers, and Universal had their own local distribution offices, Others signed deals with German studios like Ufa or Tobis to release their films. By this point, the goals of the National Socialists were well understood by the international community, and there was global outrage about their treatment of the Jews. In 1935, early in the production of Snow White, Walt Disney, 
his brother Roy, and their two wives went on a European road trip. One of the reasons for this trip was to sign a new distribution contract with Bavaria Filmkunst AG, as Disney had been sour about their previous deal with UFA. The Disneys didn't meet with any members of the Reich while in Germany, but they did meet with the family of Benito Mussolini while they were in Italy. Production of Snow White was completed and the film was released to unprecedented box office success in 1937. The Ministry of Propaganda in Germany knew they needed Disney to release Snow White. After all, it's based on a German fairy tale. Propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels was a well-known film fan, as was Hitler, both being big fans of Walt Disney. By 1937, most American studios had stopped releasing films in Germany, so the German government and the German film studios worked with Disney to negotiate a deal. Throughout 1938, the Disney company would be in frequent contact with both Bavaria Filmkunst AG and UFA, who were competing for the rights to Snow White. A total of 12 versions of Snow White were produced for international audiences in 1938, with the German version being the most difficult to iron out. That spring, while still going back and forth over negotiations, Roy Disney traveled to Amsterdam to oversee the dubbing of Snow White into various European language versions, as well as a German language version for when the deal was finalized. Hired to direct the Dutch and German versions was Kurt Guerin, a German Jew living in exile who had been a famous actor and director in Germany before 1933. It's not currently known if Disney knew he was a Jew who had fled Germany. The simplest explanation is that he was an actor and director who happened to speak German and could do the job. The production took place at Cinetone Studios in Amsterdam, and the cast of the German version was made up primarily of Jewish exiles like Garen. Dora Gerson played the Queen. Was Schönheit vergehen in Hässlichkeit, mach mein königlich Gewand in einem Bettelkleid. Otto Wahlberg played Doc. Ja, es ist, es ist eine Sie. Kurt Lillian was grumpy and sneezy. Alter Trampe! Rack, jetzt musst du niesen! Ich konnte's nicht halten. Ich krieg's halt. Wenn es kitzelt, dann kitzelt's. Siegfried Arno was happy. Happy, Fräulein! Jawohl! Und das versäppel! Er hat nie was! <laughs> and Garen himself played the magic mirror and bashful. Ihr seid die schönste Majestät. Doch nein. Dora Gerson was a German-Jewish actress who appeared in German films alongside Bela Lugosi during the silent era. She had been married to director Veit Harlan briefly in the 1920s. Harlan would later go on to direct the anti-Semitic propaganda film Jude Seuss in 1940. Gerson fled Germany for the Netherlands in 1936 and would eventually be caught and sent to Auschwitz with her husband and two children. The family was murdered at Auschwitz on February 14, 1943. Otto Wahlberg was a prominent comedian and actor who performed in dozens of movies in the 1920s and 1930s. He appeared alongside Kurt Guerin in the 1931 comedy Bombs on Monte Carlo. Also in 1931, he appeared in The Congress Dances, which was an international sensation. He escaped Germany for Austria in 1933, where he continued working in film until fleeing to France and then finally the Netherlands. After the German invasion of the Netherlands in 1940, Wahlberg was arrested and sent to the Westerbork transit camp before he was killed at Auschwitz on October 29, 1944. Kurt Lillian was an actor who was most active between 1927 and 1933. During this time, he appeared in a number of films, including Two Hearts Beat as One, starring Lillian Harvey. 
Lillian also performed in the 1927 silent film The Most Beautiful Legs of Berlin alongside Kurt Garin. He was killed at the Sobibor concentration camp in Poland on May 28, 1943. Of those who performed in Snow White, there is no one more historically significant than Kurt Garin. Unbeknownst to Disney at the time, Garin had a reputation with the new regime. To international audiences, Garin was Marlena Dietrich's manager in The Blue Angel. To the Nazis, Garin represented the personification of Jewish excess. In his films, Garin commonly played the part of the Jewish banker, lawyer, or any sort of greedy businessman. His appearance inspired many of the anti-Semitic cartoons published in right-wing newspapers of the 1930s, and in 1940 his image would be used disparagingly in the propaganda film The Eternal Jew. The film comica Garon. Die Darstellung des anrüchigen und unappetitlichen gilt dem Juden als besonders ergiebiges Gebiet für komische Wirkungen. Garin was the image most people had in their heads of what a Jew looked like. The final film directed by Kurt Garin, long after his work on Snow White was behind him, was a propaganda film praising the conditions of the concentration camps. The Reich had intended to use his international fame to show the world that Jews weren't being mistreated in concentration camps. Garin believed producing the film would save him and his wife but after the film was finished, the two were sent to Auschwitz, where they were murdered on October 28, 1944. Production on the German dub of Snow White wrapped towards the end of July 1938. Materials were sent from Amsterdam to Hollywood, where the recordings would be synced to the movie itself before release. Deals to release Snow White were already in place for other countries, but Germany was the big one and negotiations were moving slowly. As a show of goodwill, Walt Disney invited German filmmaker Lenny Riefenstahl to show her latest film Olympia at the Disney studio. Riefenstahl was controversial, however, as she produced propaganda films for the National Socialist regime. Olympia was a two-part documentary covering the 1936 Berlin Olympics, and she was preparing to travel to the United States to promote the film. Riefenstahl's debut in the United States couldn't have come at a worse time, and her untimely appearance would do irreparable harm to both Disney's public image and his lasting legacy. Shortly after Riefenstahl's arrival, on November 9, 1938, a deadly anti-Semitic pogrom would unfold across Germany. Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass, was a tipping point for the Holocaust. Jewish businesses were ransacked and destroyed, thousands were attacked and injured, and there were nearly 100 deaths. The international press lit up with reports. It's said that no other event in Germany between 1933 and 1945 had more significance in the international media. When informed of what happened, Riefenstahl dismissed the reports as anti-German propaganda. I have not believed that. I couldn't believe it. It was very impossible, because I had so many wrong things about Germany in the American papers. I thought that this is a lie, that it's not true. And so I said, it's nothing true, what the American newspaper 
Breite war zu Nazis. Ich konnte es nicht glauben. Dann stand ganz groß in der Presse in Amerika, wie ich in New York ankam, auf der einen Seite die Synagogen brennen, Geschäfte werden geplündert, Juden werden verfolgt. Auf der anderen Leni Riefenstahl hieß, it's nothing true, what the American newspaper write about the Nazi. Regardless of how she felt, the American people did not welcome her with open arms. She had planned to visit all of the major Hollywood studios, but in the wake of Kristallnacht, only one would see her, Disney. All of the other studios had pulled out of Germany by this point, but Disney was still hoping to sign the deal for Snow White. Disney personally welcomed Riefenstahl to his studio and showed her production art from Fantasia, but informed her that they wouldn't be screening her film. All of the projectionists who worked for the studio were part of the projectionist union, who were boycotting Riefenstahl. Disney did his best to salvage the Snow White deal without offending his contemporaries in Hollywood, but ultimately failed. The public had been unaware of the Snow White deal, so when Disney was the only Hollywood studio to welcome Lenny Riefenstahl immediately after Kristallnacht, the American public had been convinced he was both an anti-Semite and a supporter of the Third Reich. Maybe unfortunately for Disney, the deal fell through and Snow White wouldn't be released in Germany until the 1950s. While it may seem obvious why the deal fell through, Releasing a film in Germany post-Kristallnacht would have been an international public relations disaster. That might not be the only reason, though. The Reich Film Archive was the state-owned center dedicated to preserving film, well before film preservation became an important issue in Hollywood. The Germans recognized that they had a very big hand in shaping cinema as an art form, and they made it a priority to preserve it. Following the Soviet invasion of Germany, the Reich Film Archive was seized by Soviet forces. Within the archive was a curiosity. Four versions of Snow White, one being the unreleased German version. The Third Reich was in possession of a copy, indicating that Disney got as far as submitting the film for approval before everything fell apart. So what happened? That's the part of the story where things get fuzzy. After Riefenstahl returned to Germany in February 1939, Goebbels put a ban on American media. Snow White would have been given special permission, but Disney canceled the release altogether given the political climate. The Reich was in possession of a copy of the film, and it was likely screened for Hitler's inner circle as it was reportedly one of Hitler's favorite movies. This begs the question, did Hitler know who the voice actors were? Did Goebbels know the Queen was voiced by the Jewish ex-wife of the director he chose for Jude Seuss? These questions are difficult to answer, as it was uncommon for voice actors to be credited in animation at the time, even in the United States. The opening credits of Snow White largely focus on the artists and animators without any mention of the actors. The Reich Film Archive entry for Snow White lists the credits as they appear in the film without a single mention of the German language actors. If Hitler's inner circle had sat down to watch Snow White after dinner, as they did with a different film each night, and someone were to ask who the actors were, there would be no way to immediately answer that question. The only evidence publicly available today are newspaper clippings from the Netherlands announcing the production, as well as a newsletter by a journalist who reported on Jewish actors living in exile. As mentioned earlier, Hitler and Goebbels were movie buffs who were regular attendees of the cinema. They were well aware of who Kurt Guerin was and would likely recognize the sound of his voice. Again, Garen was seen as the personification of negative Jewish stereotypes. It's likely they would have known of his involvement after watching the film, so what would they have thought of it? No one from the Walt Disney Company has ever publicly spoken about the 1938 German version of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs featuring a cast of exiled Jews who would be murdered in the Holocaust. It would certainly be a dark secret that any company would want to cover up. But this is a story so obscure that few of those actually involved would be aware of its historical significance. Song of the South, This Is Not. 
Neither Walt Disney nor his brother Roy had been aware that Kurt Guerin was Jewish. They had no idea the cast he assembled for the German version had been Jews living in exile. If they did, it's unlikely they would have hired Guerin, but not out of a direct sense of anti-Semitism on Disney's part. It would have been anti-Semitic not to hire Guerin because he was a Jew, but that would be the cost of doing business with the Third Reich. 